Right. Um, well, hello, everyone. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I'm following Mary and Ruth, which is pretty tough. And I'm standing between you and drinks, which is pretty tough, too. But I'll try and make the next 20 minutes interesting, OK? So I work at X. Um, we're the team behind self-driving cars, self-flying delivery vehicles, smart glasses, smart contact lenses, energy kites, and internet from balloons. We work on solving large problems with technology. But this talk isn't about X. This talk is about how to kill good things, a good idea, a project, your company, or, you, or your current job to make room for truly great ones. We don't like killing our own projects because it's hard. And it's hard for two reasons, fear and inertia. And to overcome these two things that stand in your way, you have to tackle them head on. And that's what my talk is going to be about. So let's start with inertia. This is Newton's first law of motion. And as you know, as a good physicist, the bigger the mass and the faster the object is moving, the more force you have to apply to stop it or divert its path. Well, the rest of life is just the same. It's often much easier for us to just keep going. But the longer we keep going with the project, the higher is the opportunity cost if we eventually do kill it. At X, we therefore try to kill as many things as possible as early as possible. Our process starts with a small team called Rapid Eval. They're a team of polymath scientists and prototypers, and their job is to create new ideas and prototype them as quickly as possible and figure out whether they work or not. And if they don't work, they kill them. I asked Rich, the guy who runs that team, how many of his ideas make it through, uh, how many of their ideas make it through, and he said, oh, about 3%. So about 3% of rapid eval ideas make it into the next stage, which is Foundry. And that's my team. So we're a group of product managers, of engineers, of strategists. And we continue to de-risk the technology, but we also try and find product market fit. And we build business plans. And we try and do that within a year, just like a startup would do. And the goal of that year is to either de-risk the project to a point where we're comfortable growing it and therefore graduate it to become an independent X project, or we kill it. Now, you notice on this chart that we don't hire a manager for the project until it graduates from Foundry, and that's deliberate, because often the lead is the last person who wants to kill their project. The chart also illustrates the opportunity cost, the professional opportunity cost to X, that the longer we wait, to close a project down that no longer makes sense, the bigger the waste of our resources. But also think about the personal opportunity cost to the people on that team. When you wake up in the morning, are you excited about going into work? Or do you think, I'd rather be spending time with my kids or sailing a boat across the Pacific? When that balance tips, it's time to beat the inertia and move on. Now let's talk about fear. Killing our own project is scary. We're afraid of losing the respect of our peers. We're afraid of losing that promotion or of our job. Or we're simply afraid of the unknown, of what's going to happen next. I had a really big crash early on in my career, which redefined my relationship with that fear. In the late 1990s, those internet heydays that Ruth was talking about, I was working for a high-flying management consulting firm. And I did a lot of internet case studies, like for an insurance company, should we sell insurance online? We said, yes, they should. So in 1999, while all of my friends went to business school, I went to a startup instead. It was called eToys. As you might guess, we sold toys online. Um, I was one of the first product managers that they hired in the UK. So I worked on the UK website, and then I was the first person to start eToys in Germany. So I helped to set up the company, I hired the people, I worked on the website. In the summer of 2000, 
Our board back in California pulled the plug on our launch a week before the toys were coming into the warehouse. Etoys was losing too much money too fast, and expanding to Germany was not a priority. So I had to fire all those people I just hired and had sold on the internet dream. I had to fire people who came to join us after 20 years of successful careers in retail with good pension schemes. That was really, really horrible. And it didn't save eToys. We went bust just six months later. In the European team, we saw the writing on the wall, and we let everyone go one week before Christmas 2000. That was horrible too, firing people a week before Christmas. But everyone got paid, and we closed the company down in an organized fashion. In the US, eToys kept going until the creditors showed up in the office and impounded the furniture. So what I learned from that is no matter how bad things get, even at the worst time when you have to close down your company and you have to fire your friends, it's better to face those facts earlier rather than later. I'm still friends with many people of Eto at eToys, uh, that were at eToys. In fact, I saw one of them just this week. She now runs a charity um, about a cause that she's really passionate about. Many of them have gone on to do bigger and better things. So having this experience so early in my career made me fearless. Actually, that's not true. I'm scared all the time. I was scared just now when I stepped out in front of all of you. That's why I have my phone, so I have my notes in case I forget what I want to say. <laughs> but I've trained myself to be brave in the face of fear. And in fact, that's the definition of bravery. Bravery is about taking action in spite of your fears. When you decide to kill a project or your company, that takes perhaps the most bravery. But we don't have that opportunity every day. So how can we train ourselves to be brave? Well, it turns out there are many opportunities to practice bravery in our work and in our lives. So here's my list of five opportunities to practice bravery. Number one, jump in, try something new. Even if you have no idea whether you're going to be good at it. You all remember the first day in your first job, right? When you walked in and you had no clue what was going on. I started in consulting. I didn't know what Excel was until some kind soul showed me. <laughs> I did such a jump into the unknown again almost four years ago when I came here to X. I left behind a great role as director of consumer marketing um, in EMEA in Europe. I left behind a team I loved where I knew everybody. I left behind a credible ca career in marketing. Even though I've always thought of myself as a product manager, I found myself to be the number four on the UK list of top marketers just after the CMO of Unilever. I also left behind the UK, which has been my home for 20 years, and uprooted my family to move to California. I was excited to begin a new challenge, but I was also really scared to walk into a team at X that was made up of scientists and engineers only. Neither they nor I knew what I would be doing or whether I would add any value. So how did I get over that fear? Well, I gave myself a safety net. I agreed with my new boss at X, Astro, that I would come for six months to try it out. And I agreed with my old boss back in Europe, Jonja, to treat it like a maternity leave. I would be gone for six months, and then I would come back, just like after having a baby. After three months, I called her, and I said, I'm not coming back. And she said, you know, I kind of suspected that was going to happen. <laughs> but I truly didn't know, and that's why I built the safety net. Number two, ask stupid questions and question assumptions. I attribute some of my success in leading teams to my willingness to always ask stupid questions. My team knows this. In my job, I have to learn about a new area all the time. I'm always the person in the room who knows the least about an area. So I ask a lot of questions. And often I find that there are other people in the room who also didn't know how that worked or what this stupid acronym stood for. 
And I found that the experts, especially the engineers, are incredibly patient and love to explain things to you. <laughs> you just have to ask them. Although I'm not an engineer myself, I lead engineering teams. At first, this was incredibly intimidating. How can I be their lead if I can't be their tech lead? It turns out that it's very valuable to check the assumptions that have been made by everyone. Because widely held assumptions often mask decisions that haven't actually been made. And what you'll find out if you question them is that everyone holds slightly different assumptions. Other times, my questions point to an area that nobody has thought about yet at all. So it turns out that stupid questions can often be hard questions or helpful questions. Number three, share your work before it's done. So Google always had this launch early and iterate um, principle. Gmail was famously in beta for, I think it was about five years. When Chrome first launched, many websites didn't even render on it properly especially banking ones. At X, we work on hardware, which takes a long time to get out, much longer than hardware. So what we do is we take our prototypes out to get them in contact with the real world long before they're ready, long before they're anywhere near a finished product in the conventional sense. Our self-driving car prototypes have driven hundreds of millions of miles on real roads testing our hardware and our software. And with Google Glass, we ran perhaps the biggest experiment of all. In the Explorer program, we asked people to test not just the device, the hardware and the software, but also to give us feedback on the use cases, what it might be useful for. So from surgeons to chefs, to parents, to oil engineers, to fashion models, people tried it out and they gave us feedback. Lots of bad feedback, some good feedback, and we learned so much. The feedback was invaluable. And in the end, it led the Glass team to pivot away from a consumer product to a device that's aimed more at the business market. Now, it's always better to get that feedback earlier rather than later. And this doesn't just apply to products. It applies to anything. It could be a half-baked idea that you share with your team. It could be some paper wireframes that you show to your friends and family. What matters is that you don't keep polishing it and polishing it until you feel comfortable sharing it. You have to still feel uncomfortable because I guarantee you if you wait until it's polished and you feel comfortable, it's too late. Number four, stand up for your opinion. It can be especially scary if you're the only person in the room who has a different view from everyone else. Our first use case for Wing, our drone project, was to deliver defibrillators to people who just had a heart attack. Every minute counts after a heart attack. So the idea was that we would get you the defibrillator faster than the ambulance can get there and thus save lives. This assumption turned out to be wrong. Matt, one of the researchers in our user experience team, put dummies in the lab and he got innocent bystanders and he gave them the defibrillator and he said, this person's just had a heart attack, saved their life. And he timed how long it took them to figure out how to use a defibrillator. It turns out, quite a long time. In fact, about the same time that it takes on average for the ambulance to arrive. And if you do it wrong, it doesn't work at all. The trouble was the team was in love with this use case. They loved the idea of saving lives by delivering defibrillators. Some of them had joined the project because of it. So Matt had to show the data and his conclusions again and again. In the end, he got help from Laura, one of my team members. And they finally convinced the team to let go of this idea. So we still think that delivering stuff with flying things is a good idea, but we won't be delivering defibrillators. So this brings me back to killing your own project. I already mentioned that 97% of rapid eval investigations get killed. Early this month, we closed down a project in Foundry. After the team came to us with the conclusion that it no longer made sense to pursue it, they wrote a really detailed postmortem where they explained why. 
They stood up at the All Hands this week at X and they explained it to everyone for half an hour. And later this year, we hope to publish their findings in a peer-reviewed journal. The important part is this. I didn't kill that project. And Rich, who runs Rapid Eval, doesn't kill the Rapid Eval investigations. It's always the team. Because Xers are encouraged to kill their ideas and to kill their projects as soon as it makes sense to do so. And they're rewarded for it. In Rapid Eval, they get a sticker of a crumpled piece of paper. And they put it on their laptops as a badge of honor. People get applause from their, from their peers. They get a spot bonus. I gave my team that closed down their own project a spot bonus. They get promoted because of it, not despite it. And they get exciting new jobs, because as soon as a project closes down, every other project tries and recruit them. So in other words, we remove the fear, and we make it safe for people to kill their own project. Now, Let's talk about the elephant in the room. Some of you might be thinking, OK, that's really nice. You work at X. Um, but my organization is nothing like this. So for those of you who are running companies and for those of you who are running teams in the room, please, this is your job. right? You have to remove the fear and remove the inertia. So please go back and do that next week. If you work in a team where the culture is not supportive of this kind of behavior, you have two options. You can change the culture from within, or you move on. In between Google, uh, in between eToys and Google, I worked in um, brick and mortar retailers for five years, for a very simple reason. When eToys went bust in 2001, how many e-commerce startups do you think got funded? Not many. <laughs> but in retail, I often felt like an alien that had landed in another planet. And in my last job, just before Google, the culture in my e-commerce team was very different from the rest of the company. And the physical manifestation of this was the fact that we had painted our walls pink and turquoise in a fun team event because the office was really drab. Now, this sounds ridiculous, but it was so radical that the rumor that the crazy e-commerce team was painting their walls spread throughout the entire building like a wildfire. And people kept showing up at our door with a mug of tea you know, on the pretense that they just wanted to check on something to see whether it was really true. Unfortunately, the wider organization remained unchanged. And in the end, I wasn't patient enough, not savvy enough in corporate politics to be successful long term in that kind of environment. So I left for Google. And when I walked into Google, it wasn't just the primary colors of the logo and the bouncy balls in the hallway that reminded me of eToys. So far, I've talked mostly about why it's so important to teach ourselves bravery and how to practice it in our work and in our lives. But arguably, it's even more important to teach bravery to the next generation, especially our girls. Reshma Sajani, the founder of Girls Who Code, gave a, gave a really brilliant TED talk a few weeks ago where she talked about this. And she talked about how boys are taught to climb trees and fall off and graze their knees while girls are taught to be pretty and perfect. And she talked about how in their camps, the boys have no problem with sharing imperfect work, whereas the girls would rather show a blank screen than show their attempts at solving a coding problem where they feel they failed. My daughter is two years old, and I'm proud to say that she's a fearless climber. I found this out last summer when I was chatting to a friend in the playground and not paying attention. Another parent tapped me on the shoulder and said, very disapprovingly, is that your child on the top there? And I turned around to see her on the top of the big kid climbing structure. And the boy on the right is her eight-year-old brother. But you see, she's higher than him. <laughs> I was very scared at this point. <laughs> and I ran over. But then I also felt very proud, so I took a photo. And that on the right is Cosima just last week at the climbing gym. She's about two meters off the wall, up the wall, um, where she's running out of boulders, because that's how high they make the kids' climbing wall. Now, I hope she will always climb on all her life. You are all building incredible things. 
but what I hope I've done today is to inspire you to kill some things along the way. Thank you. Thank you.